Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good morning. This lecture today is the second in a series of talks on Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga. So the first one was last month. I think it was called Our Real Nature. And this one is Maya. I've never spoken on this subject earlier. It's perhaps the most difficult subject that I have ever taken up. Um, so be ready to go away with a headache. <laughs> Brahman is very simple. Maya is complicated. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda devoted three whole lectures on Maya in his series of talks on Jnana Yoga in London. In fact, the house where he gave those talks, is, it's still there. And if you go there, they have a blue circle system in the United Kingdom where it's a heritage place. It says uh, the Hindu philosopher and monk gave uh, talks here in this house. It's there in London. Manmatanath Ganguly, one of, Sri, uh, one of Swami Vivekananda's disciples, approached him once. Um, Swami Vivekananda was, was very happy with him and said, um, ask for something and I'll, I'll give it to you. And Manmat, uh, ask me a question. So Manmatanath asked, I have read your lectures on Maya. But I want to know about it more fully from you. Please tell me what is Maya. And Swami Vivekananda said, ask something else. <laughs> <laughs> but Manmata persisted. He said, if I cannot know this from you, from a guru like you, then I will never understand it in my life. I have got a guru like you and this is something that I want to know in my life. Then Swami Vivekananda started speaking. And Manmata has his uh, reminiscences. We learned about it from there. He started speaking. After some time, Manmata said, it's as if literally, not even as if, literally the world started spinning around him. And it dissolved. He says, he gives an example. I don't think it's there in the English translation of his reminiscences. In the original Bengali, it's there. That uh, when you look at a fire, and just above a fire, there is, um, you know, if you see the, 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 because of the heat, there's a shimmer the world seems to come in and out of focus. So the room around him, the place around him, seemed to vibrate, come in and out of focus. You know, like it's as if it's disappearing. After some time, Vivekananda himself disappears. His own, Manmata's own body has disappeared. He's just hearing the voice of Vivekananda. And then he bursts out. He says, he bursts out in a high-pitched voice. He's saying, all this is Maya. Even you, what you are doing, all this Ramakrishna mission, the monastery, all your work, this is all Maya. And Vivekananda, um, so he says this, and suddenly he realizes, in, in Bengali, in Indian languages, there are different ways of, ways of saying you. In Old English also there was, thou, and uh, you. So you say apni to somebody who's senior. So, Guru, Vivekananda is his guru, he should have said apni, but he said to me. To me means you, when you say it to somebody who is your inferior or to a child, somebody in any way, not, certainly not your guru. He realized he had said to me to Vivekananda. The moment he realized this, you know, the sense of difference comes and our, the world snapped back into place. And Vivekananda is there sitting at him and looking, uh, sitting and looking at him and smiling. And Vivekananda said, you are right, all this is Maya. And if you do not like this play of Maya, then go into the Himalayan fastness and meditate and, and merge into Brahman. But if you cannot, then come and help in this work. <laughs> um, unfortunately, what Vivekananda said, Manmath has not written that down. Uh, so I don't think I can deliver that to you today to make the world disappear. But uh, I think I can reasonably promise you a, a, a fairly uh, intense headache today. <laughs> but Vivekananda's lectures are there, the, the talks on Maya. 
So today's talk is based on what Vivekananda said about Maya in three lectures. I'll try my best to, to summarize what he has said. Vivekananda spoke about Maya in a, in a refreshing new way, you know, like a, in a very direct way. Those who have read those lectures, you will always, you will never forget. And this is Maya, and this is Maya, and this is Maya. To understand his approach, the refreshing, the new, the novel in his approach to Maya, one must first take a look at the classical approach to Maya. Now, Maya is an ancient word, and it is accepted by all schools of, just about every school of Indian philosophy, Hindu and Buddhist. But the way the non-dualists, Advaitins, talk about Maya, that's what we're going to talk about today, that's unique. That's different from the other schools. Um, in general, the schools of Hinduism, the Tantra, the, the, the Vaishnavas, they all accept Maya as the power of God, Shakti. Uh, so the power of God to create, and it's a real power, and God's creation with Maya is a real creation. Here is this universe. God has created this universe. This is the way it is understood in the other schools. But the, this Maya takes on a unique approach in, uh, the approach to Maya in Advaita Vedanta is unique. In classical Advaita Vedanta, what is Maya? Let's quickly take a look at it. And then we will go on to Vivekananda's approach to Maya. The literature on Maya is vast. Is, uh, is, um, in fact, there's more written on Maya than on Brahman. <laughs> uh, there's more written on falsity than on reality. <laughs> um, the, the unique approach to Maya in Advaita Vedanta is encapsulated in the, the central teaching of Advaita Vedanta. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jiva Brahme Vanapara. Brahman alone is the reality. The absolute, existence absolute, knowledge absolute, bliss absolute is the only reality. Then what is this world? This uh, pluralistic world, this variegated world which we see spread out before us, what is this? So this is um, Jagat Mithya, it's an appearance. This mithya is another name for maya, that it's an appearance, appearance of Brahman. It's not real in itself. What are we then? Are we real or an appearance? Jiva Brahmaiva Napara. You are none other than that absolute. You do not know yourself. If you really knew yourself, you would realize, Aham Brahmasmi, I am the absolute, of which the universe is an appearance. So this is a unique formulation the non-dualists have this Advaita Vedanta, and it got the non-dualists into no end of trouble because they were immediately fiercely attacked by the other schools, the orthodox schools of uh, Hind uh, Hindu other schools of Hinduism, the dualists, qualified monists, and so on and so forth. In fact, it led to a tremendous flowering of philosophy. If you look back upon the history of Indian philosophy, you can see three periods of uh, glorious development, tremendous flowering and uh, richness. One is at the dawn of Indian philosophy, when from the Vedas, philosophy emerged, darshana. Darshana means philosophy. L darshana literally means to see, to see. Darshana em emerged. Um, that was the age of the sutrakaras, the, the, those who wrote the sutras, the aphorisms. The Nyaya Sutras of, of Gautama, the Vaisheshika Sutras of Kanada, the Yoga Sutras, which are very famous, even now they are studied, uh, you know, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, the Sankhya Sutras of Kapila, which are lost, um, the, the Purva Mimamsa Sutras of Jaimini, and the Brahma Sutras of Vyasa, Badrayana and Vyasa. So this, the age of the Sutras, that was the beginning of the different schools of uh, of uh, uh, philosophy. The next great period of development in Indian philosophy came a few centuries later with the emergence of Buddhism. So Buddhism was such a strong challenge, powerful challenge, Purva Paksha, powerful challenge to the orthodox schools of Hinduism. So that set off a thousand year debate, I kid you not, one thousand years. Uh, from about a couple of hundred years after the Buddha, 
uh, till around the time of Shankaracharya, just after that. Nearly a thousand years in which the Buddhists attacked the two most precious beliefs of the Hindus, the belief in an immortal soul, Atma, and the Buddhists said, Anatma, no self. And God, that there is a God, Ishwara, the Buddhists are agnostic about it. They may be, who knows, not interested, <laughs> doesn't matter. So this huge debate, it sparked off for a thousand years, the Hindus trying to defend the theses of an immortal soul and uh, of, of uh, an eternal God, all-powerful creator, and the Buddhists attacking them relentlessly. And both sides developed. It was like a philosophical arms race. Both the logic developed, the philosophy of language developed, um, the methods of interpretation of the scriptures developed. On the Hindu side, the Nyaya school and the Purva Mimamsa school were the two primary uh, schools which developed a lot, a lot of philosophical literature at this time. But that does not concern us. The next burst of development uh, of um, Indian philosophy was after Shankaracharya. So when the dualists, now it's within Hinduism, the dualists attacked the non-dualists. So this continued for about 500 years after Shankaracharya, uh, where they tried to attack the, non, the Advaita, non-dualist school, and most of the attacks were concentrated on the non-dualist formulation of Maya. So Maya, they immediately saw this is the weak link, and this is where the attacks have to be concentrated. So what was the Advaita formulation of Maya? What is Maya? When we started studying Advaita Vedanta, our introductory textbook was Vedanta Sara, which is a rather boring, dry little book. Uh, of, it's like a book of definitions. It gets you, but it gives you a solid foundation for studying classical non-dualism, classical Advaita Vedanta. In that, there is a definition or a description of Maya. So you have to, we have to, we had to learn it, memorize it. Remember, in the Advaita point of view, Maya is at its at its core. Maya is nothing but ignorance. Agyanam. Agyanam means ignorance. Ignorance of what? our true nature. We do not know we are Brahman and hence all the problems. So you have to know you are Brahman. Ignorance is the problem, Maya, and Jnanam, knowledge, is the solution. So the definition of Maya is the definition of ignorance in, in uh, Vedanta Sara. And it goes like this, Agyanam tu, ignorance is, or Maya is, so five, five things. Sadasad bhyam anirvachanyam. I'll explain. Sadasad bhyam anirvachanyam. Um, trigunatmakam. Jnana virodhi. Um, bhava rupam. Yatkinchit. What does it mean? This maya or ignorance, you cannot say that it is. Seeing that once you become enlightened, it is not. One Swami put it very beautifully. This question about maya. Why all this? How did the one become the many? One Swami said very beautifully, he said, on our side of enlightenment, when we are not enlightened, on our side we have the question, there's no answer. <laughs> and on their side, after enlightenment, they have the answer, there's no question. <laughs> <laughs> so, sad asad bhya manir vachaniyam. It, you cannot say maya is an ultimate reality because after enlightenment there is no maya for you. For you, the enlightened person. But you cannot say that it does not exist either, because seeing that we see all this. Our entire life is lived in Maya. So you cannot say it is, you cannot say it is not. Sat asadbhyam anirvachaniyam cannot be expressed as is or is not. The second thing is trigunatmakam. This is, this is Maya. What is it composed of? Can you say what is Maya made of? And the answer the non dualists take from the Sankhya cosmology. Three gunas sattva, rajas, tamas. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. I will not go into all this. We discuss it again and again. But this is something that we have borrowed from Sankhya cosmology. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Three gunas. Maya is made of three gunas. Then, very important, Jnana Virodhi. Maya is opposed to knowledge. Opposed to knowledge, is, you must understand carefully, Maya is that which is destroyed by knowledge. 
It's a fancy way of saying that knowledge removes ignorance. So what you are ignorant, what I'm ignorant about, I need knowledge about that. If I, do, if I don't know chemistry, then I need, I'm ignorant of chemistry. So I need knowledge of chemistry, yes. If I, I don't know French, I'm ignorant of French, I need knowledge of French. And that will remove that particular ignorance. If I do not know my real self, as Advaita Vedanta claims, I'm ignorant of my real self, then I need knowledge, jnanam, of my real self. And that will remove ignorance. So ignorance is jnana virodhi, it is cancelled by knowledge or negated by knowledge. That's another characteristic of ignorance, uh, of maya. Then the next one is bhava rupam. These are all very controversial. Bhava rupam. It's not an absence. Ignorance is not just an absence of knowledge. It's a positive something. Why a positive something? Because in Advaita Vedanta, Maya has two functions. It does two things. One, it obscures the reality, Brahman. It veils the reality. It does not allow you to know yourself as you are. One. This is called Avarana. Uh, and the second one is Vikshepa. Vikshepa means error. It projects the reality as it is not. It's not so difficult to understand. I do not, I see a snake by mistake. It's a rope. I did not know the rope as a rope. Veiled. Uh, and next what happened? Because I did not know the rope as a rope, I mistook it for a snake. You can, you can mis, mis, uh, mistake it for something else also. So you mistook it for a snake. So that is projection, error. That is called vikshepa. There are two functions. Sri Ramakrishna, in his beautiful example, he says, one of the functions of Maya is Avarana. It hides the reality. And he gives the beautiful story from Ramayana, where Rama and Sita and Lakshmana are on their way to the forest in exile. And Rama walk, walks ahead. Here, Rama is Paramatma, the Supreme Self. And Lakshmana is Jivatma, the individual self, us. And Sita is the veil of Maya. So she is in between, and Rama is in front. And us, we, we the individual beings, Lakshmana is at the back. And Lakshmana can see Rama only if Sita graciously steps aside and lets him see. So that's uh, Sri Ramakrishna's beautiful example. In fact, when I was preparing this talk, I looked up what Sri Ramakrishna had said about Maya. And really, that's a subject in itself. We should have a separate lecture of, on Sri Ramakrishna on Maya. Very beautiful things. We, we have discussed it from time to time. Um, he speaks about the serpent, the cobra, which has poison in its mouth. Little bit of that poison is enough to knock out a mouse or a frog. But all the poison is in the mouth of the cobra, but it doesn't do anything to the cobra. It's the power of the cobra. So Sri Ramakrishna says, Maya is the power by which we are all deluded. We are trapped in samsara. But the entire power is wielded by God, Ishwara, Saguna Brahman. But Ishwara is not trapped by Maya. So that's an example he gives. Um, another example he gives is when the water is muddy, he says it does not form a, a good reflection of the sun or the moon. The sun or the moon is not reflected properly in muddy water. But if it's clear, then the reflection is good. Similarly, he says, in the mind deluded by Maya, Atma Sakshatkara, the realization of the self, it's not clear. Atman is right here, but it's not clear. Covering. This is our and a veil. Another very simple village example he gives. For this, you have to see villages in Bengal. There are lots of these little ponds. They're called Pukur. In fact, Sri Ramakrishna's birthplace, Kamar Pukur. It's a pond, a village pond. And you remember, you must know that Bengal is a very fertile place. I mean, it's, uh, it's always overgrown. It's, it's uh, luxurious there. So the ponds are often covered with a kind of creeper, a water plant. It covers the surface of the water. Pana, he says. Um, hyacinth, it's hyacinth. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna says, you can't see the water. When you go and push it aside, then the sparkling water underneath you can see. But the moment you let go, it dances, he says, it dances back and co covers everything. Similarly, he says that when you are you know, 
contemplating Vedanta, when you're in holy company, when you're meditating and praying, it seems to disappear. Samsara goes away. But the moment you let go, it dances back into you again. <laughs> so these are the examples he gives. The two functions of Maya, Vikshepa and Avarana, veiling and projection. How can it have two functions if Maya is nothing? It must have some kind of positive entity. Remember, I'm talking about the five characteristics of Maya in Vedanta Sa. So one characteristic is Bhava Rupam. It, it has a positive dimension, that it is a positive entity. There is something called Maya. It's not just an absence of knowledge. When you say ignorance, you can say ignorance is an absence of knowledge. But no, the non-dualists hold that this Maya is not just an absence of knowledge. It's not that I don't know, that's it. No, there is a positive force which has these two powers. So it's called Bhava Rupam, as if it exists. And then finally, the last one, Yatkinchit. It's a mysterious something. <laughs> what do you mean, it's a mysterious something? Um, there, the, uh, the description is that you cannot characterize Maya as it is this. In Sanskrit, idam itham, it is like this. You cannot say that about Maya. It, it is, it can't, it's hard to pin down. And that's the very nature of Maya. Sri Ramakrishna talks about this. He says that um, it's like a man possessed by a ghost. He did not know he was possessed by a ghost um, until he thinks about it and it leaves him immediately. We say it, you know, we had, it's a figure of speech. Whatever possessed you, we say. So when you contemplate upon, look upon it, it suddenly disappears. So Maya is like that. Yat kinchit, which does not bear the, the, the light of reason. If you focus, if you reflect upon it, if you concentrate upon it, it vanishes. Um, in Uttarakhand, in the, in the Himalayas, the sadhus have a saying, the monks have a saying about Maya, about uh, Agyan. They say, in Hindi first, Agyan ko pratishtit karne ka koshish mat ki jiye Mahatma ji. Agyan ko kaatiye. Don't try to establish Agyan, ignorance. Try to cut, a, cut down ignorance. Don't try to establish that ignorance is by these proofs. You can never do that. And that's not the point of non-dualism. The point is, there is something which we do not know. Let's try to know it. That's the thing. So these are the five characteristics, and I'm, I will come, I'll tell you why I'm saying all this. We are getting a, a taste of what the classical analysis of Maya was. What is the classical presentation of Maya? This is from Vedanta Sara, which was written about 700 years ago. And this idea of the non-dualists came under heavy attack by the other schools um, for nearly 500 years. And the non-dualists responded. So to get a, get a taste of the kind of attack that came from the other schools, uh, Ramanu Jacharya, who lived about a thousand years ago, who wrote the commentaries, laid the foundation of Vishishtadvaita, qualified monism. So he attacks non-dualism, Advaita Vedanta. He attacks non-dualism in his masterpiece, Sri Bhashyam. So um, there, the, the style of debate in ancient India was that if we are going to have a debate, if you say something before I reply, I must restate to you what you said to your satisfaction. Is this what you said? Do you have to agree? Yes. Then I can reply. You can see how many quarrels it would prevent. Most of the time when we are very arguing, it goes into quarrel, de uh, develops into or degenerates into quarrels because I'm not really listening to what you are saying. I'm thinking of my reply, you know, like the, this reply is going to blow you away. I'm not really not even listening to the other side. I'm just listening. To, nowadays, it's, it's like that they call it an echo chamber. Uh, so we just l listen to our point of view and then keep giving replies without listening to the other person. Look, here you have to restate to that other person's satisfaction. Is this what you said? And then I can, I'm allowed to reply. So Ramanuja Acharya, when he's attacking Advaita Vedanta in the classical style, he restates the position of Advaita Vedanta. What is Advaita saying, non-dualism saying? They are saying this. 
So in that in his book, it's called Mahapurva Paksha, the great opponent. Who's the great opponent? The non-dualists. And he does such a fair job of it. You know, often when people argue, you set up a straw man and knock it down and say, I won the argument. But here, Ramanuja gives a very fair statement. One of our Swamis was a great scholar of non-dualism and, and is a very staunch non-dualist. He admits that Ramanuja is a gentleman because he does a fair job of stating our position. Is this what you said? And we say, yes. Ah, now listen. And then he proceeds to shred non-dualism non to pieces over the next few pages. So his main attack is on Maya. Um, Maya gets a poor rep, bad rep, you know. <laughs> Maya is not all bad. Sri Ramakrishna says Maya is avidya Maya and vidya Maya. Avidya Maya is, is that which traps us in samsara. He says kama, krodha, lust and anger and greed and jealousy and uh, pride. These are um, avidya Maya, the Maya of ignorance. But there is vidya Maya, there is the Maya of knowledge also, uh, which is viveka and vairagya, the conviction that there is an ultimate reality, the dispassion for temporal things and trying to attain the eternal. So vidya Maya, and in fact the way out of Maya is also through Maya. Swami Vivekananda says you cannot escape the machine. You must learn how to work the machine. Then it will set you free. So give up avidya Maya. Take up vidya Maya, which is basically what we call spirituality. And that, then the machine sets you free. So Maya is not all bad. <laughs> but Ramanuja um, trains his guns on Maya. Sevenfold objection. If you listen to the objections, your whole um, understanding, your whole faith in non-dualism will be shaken. The whole house of non-dualism begins to tremble and, 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 and crumble under these uh, tremendous attacks. What are these attacks? Seven. Sapta vidha nupapatti. The seven great inconsistencies in Maya, he says. Uh, what are they? Just as a taste. <laughs> I haven't started yet. <laughs> but if you, if you know this, it will give you a good insight on, into what Vivekananda was doing when he, when he begins to say, and this is Maya, and this is Maya. What are the seven great inconsistencies in Maya? Maya itself is inconsistency. So what are the seven great inconsistencies in the theory of Maya? First, he says, um, the word he uses is anupapatti. Anupapatti means inconsistency or illogicality. So the first one is called um, ashraya anupapatti. The locus of Maya, where is this precious ignorance of yours? Yeah. Is it in Brahman? But how can ignorance be there in Brahman? Brahman is the absolute reality. It's like saying there is darkness in the sun. Can't be. But it can't be there in, in the jiva, in the individual being. There are only two places where ignorance can be. In us or in the ultimate reality. Where is it? But it can't be in us also because... Brahman, according to you, the non-dualists, Brahman alone is appearing as the jiva because of ignorance. So ignorance must precede the existence of the jiva. Where is your ignorance, dear sir? <laughs> this is Ashraya Anupapatti. The next, Swarupa Anupapatti. And what is this ignorance? Is it real? Is it unreal? Um, what, is, what is the nature of this ignorance? Swarupa. Um, and there's a very powerful attack there. Then the third one, uh, you, our answer was, if you now remember, it cannot be said to exist, it cannot be said to not exist. Sad asad bhyam anirvachaniyam. The third one is anirvachani anupapatti, an attack directly on this. What you are saying is a logical inconsistency. A thing is either true or false. In logic there is the law of the excluded middle. You can't say it is both true and false. You can't say it is neither true nor false. No. Um, so you cannot say anirvachaniya, that it, it cannot be expressed as is and is not. Anirvachaniya anupapatti. Third. Um, fourth. Tirodhana anupapatti. <laughs> it says, Maya obscures Brahman. Ign ignorance obscures Brahman. How can the absolute existence, consciousness, bliss, how can it be obscured? How can you think of anything hiding, make, tirodhana means disappears, vanishes. 
How can Brahman vanish because of something like Maya? It's impossible. You might as well shut your eyes and say the sun has vanished. No. So the impossibility of Maya obscuring or veiling Brahman. Tirodhana Nupapatti. And, and then it goes on to speak about um, the um, Bhava Rupatva Nupapatti. You said Maya is a positive something. Because it, remember it has the function of obscuring and projecting. Yes, Avarana Vikshepa. But that's not reasonable. Ignorance is simply the absence of knowledge. You know or you do not know. You do not know is just the absence of uh, knowledge. You, that's the absence of knowing is not knowing. What is this positive not knowing? <laughs> Bhava Rupatva Nupatti. Then the sixth one, Nivartaka Nupapatti. What will remove this so-called ignorance? According to you, the knowledge of Nirguna Brahman. I am Brahman. What kind of Brahman? Brahman beyond all attributes, all qualities, all adjectives. But according to Ramanuja, who is a theist, the ultimate reality has many qualities. You can't talk about an unqualified reality because there's a very logical point here. Anything that you know must have certain characteristics. Otherwise, how will you know it? How will you know it as? It is like this. So it means this list of characteristics. So Nirguna Brahman, Brahman without any characteristics is impossible. There is no such thing. Only Brahman, Brahman means God. God has many characteristics. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, all loving, all benevolent and so on and so forth. Ananta Gunagana, Kalyana Gunagana, he says in Sanskrit. Um, Brahman is a repository of infinite auspicious qualities. So this, because there is no such thing as Nirguna Brahman, there is no knowledge of Nirguna Brahman possible, and so overcoming Ajnana is not possible. Nivartaka Nupapatti. And finally he says, Nivritti Anupapatti. There is no possibility of going beyond, if there is such a Maya which you are speaking about, beginningless Maya, there is no possibility of going beyond this Maya. If it is there, you are finished. Um, you, you are forever trapped in it. And there, is a, there are reasons why. Sevenfold. A tremendous attack. If you actually read the objections in detail, you'll be convinced. It's gone. <laughs> Non-dualism, he's gone. I remember, and it's not related, but funny, um, many, many years ago, when we, um, we become monks, uh, and these young people who become monks, immediately it arouses tremendous opposition among parents, and especially more than the parents, the uncles and aunties, and so so. So often they come charging to get their boy back from the monastery. Uh, it's, <laughs> uh, there's a story of, I don't know how true it is, somebody came and said, I want to um, uh, talk to the person in, in charge here. Uh, they went to the main monastery. Uh, because my boy has, has a, a run away without my permission. So I want to talk to the person in charge so that he will send my boy back. Who is the person in charge? Oh, he's the general secretary of the order. But no good talking to him. Why? Because he also ran away from home without him. <laughs> <laughs> no, why I'm saying this is once when I was an, um, n a novice, a new brahmachari in the place where I joined, another brahmachari young young man joined from the same place I had come from. Um, place, uh, uh, so so. His parents came looking, and his, his father was a big man in the police department. He came with a detective, fully convinced that his boy had been kidnapped. <laughs> now, the Swami in charge, he said, uh, I'm too busy to, he didn't want to speak with him. And then he said, you speak that language, he, he told me. You speak that language, go speak with them. And the boy, the, their son, disappeared. He didn't want to speak with his parents. He didn't want to confront them. So I was... <laughs> <laughs> facing this really uh, furious mother and father. Luckily, they didn't sick the detective on me, but... And the parents had come with all sorts of arguments, why you should not be a monk, and why you should go, come back, uh, into, back home. And they couldn't tell their son, from whom they had prepared all those arguments, so they got hold of me. <laughs> and they tried out all their arguments on me. Why, should, why shouldn't be a monk and go back? Later on in the evening, the Swami asked me, how did it go? I said, I don't know about that boy, but I'm convinced. I told them, you, even if your son doesn't come back, I'm sold. I'm coming back with you. <laughs> 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 
And in spite of their fury, they smiled. <laughs> You will be scared if you read this, these tremendous attacks on non-dualism. You think that's gone. But wait, there are answers to all these questions. Remarkably good answers. In fact, it's available in English too. There's a book, Seven Great Untenables. Professor John Grimes, he's in Canada, in, uh, in Alberta. He has collected these, uh, all these arguments and given a very lucid English translation. So, and it's useful if you read that, you begin to get a deeper understanding of non-duality. If your position is attacked and you can defend it successfully, you have understood your position even more deeply. So you get a much deeper understanding of non-duality when you face these questions and then you understand Maya in depth. Now all this is very philosophical, tremendously dialectical, logical. What Vivekananda does is you will see same things the same idea of inconsistency, con contradictoriness, paradox, he brings it to our life. And he points out, in our life, instead of talking the language of logic, he points it out, the language of life, and shows Maya in our lives. One by one, and this is Maya, and this is Maya, and this is Maya. I counted 17 times, 17 times. Let me give you some examples. Powerful language. There is the tremendous fact of death. I'm quoting him. There's the tremendous fact of death. Everything dies. All our progress, our wealth, our achievement, our knowledge, all goes to death. Cities crumble. Cities are overtaken by forests. In India, we have a saying, um, a thousand years a city, a thousand years a forest. Same place. He uh, says, mountains crumble to dust. Planets are blown away and, and <laughs> into dust and they, they become parts of the atmospheres of other planets. These are his act actual words. And today we know tremendous explosions of supernova and entire solar systems wiped out. Death. The poet Rabindranath Tagore says, a leaf, dry leaf falls from the tree into a pond. Uh, setting of ripples. These ripples spread out into the universe among the stars and galaxies. Change and death everywhere. Vivekananda says, saints die and sinners die. Kings die and paupers die. The learned die and the ignorant die. All must die. And yet there is this tremendous clinging to life. We know it is certain that we will die. And yet the most powerful is clinging to life. Uh, and this is Maya, he says. And this is Maya. I was reading Ernst Becker's The Denial of Death. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning book, a very really dark book. There, he says, his basic thesis is that this tremendous fact of death is the prime motivating factor. The fear of death is the prime motivating factor for humanity. This fact of death is there, and we say, no, no, I'm not afraid of death. I don't think about it. He says, ah, ah, you don't think about it. Remember, he's a psychoanalyst, Freudian, repression. You have suppressed it. So uh, in Freudian psychoanalysis, and this is New York, the <laughs> at one time it was in, in, in fashion, everybody, like you say, my guru is my, my therapist. So everybody had a therapist. The pricier, the more well-placed you are. <laughs> and... Um, if you say you have a problem, yes, there's a solution. If you say you, have a no, you don't have a problem, I'm all right, I have a more serious problem, repression. <laughs> I suppressed it. Somebody asked Freud, actually did they asked, what is, no, what is normal? Because whatever you say, you're abnormal. There's something wrong with you. And Freud gave a beautiful definition of normality. He said, um, the ability to do your work and to love. So if you're functional in your life, more or less, you can just take care of your, your business, your life, and you can relate to others normally, then you're normal. A very beautiful definition, actually. So uh, the, in that book, he says, this tremendous fear of death is there. It haunts us, but we repress it. And you know, in Freudian psychoanalysis, you cannot repress anything forever. It comes out. So it comes out, he says, in the form of um, what he calls immortality projects. 
all the great endeavors of human life, from raising a family, to making a business, to conquering an empire, all of that is our struggle to conquer death. I know I will die and my reaction is this. I suppress it and my reaction is this. Whether it's children or a big organization or an empire um, or art, um, writing a book, becoming famous, I will live on. But they are all doomed to failure. Because the kind of immortality we want, this is not that kind of immortality. Or nationalism. Um, I will die for my country and I will be immortal as the person who died for his country. But this is not really in our hearts. This is not what we want. What do we want? We want to live like this. Not uh, in that kind of immortality. Woody Allen, here he, somebody asked him, do you want, so you want to become immortal on the silver screen. You want to live forever in your movies and your books. He said, typical Woody Allen, he said, no, I want to live forever in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. We don't want, we really, that kind of immortality, we all try to get it, but that's a poor substitute for what we secretly want. We want to exist. This clinging to life, this is Maya, he says, Swami Vivekananda. Then, this tremendous contradiction in knowledge. We feel that we can know, and we are knowing more and more and more. But as we go forward, we run into paradoxes. We run into eternal time, is his words. We run into immeasurable space, and the endless walls of causation, time, space, and causation, seems to hem us in, bind us, set a limit to our knowledge. Um, I was reading Kurt Godel. There's a biography written by Rebecca Goldstein. She's a professor here in uh, Barnard College. So she, in the introduction, she, say, she says, the great discoveries in physics of the 20th century, look at the names, Einstein's theory of relativity, he Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty, Godel's theorem of incompleteness. Look at the names. So when she writes that, I just, it struck me suddenly, relativity, uncertainty, incompleteness. These are the very words used by the ancient philosophers to describe Maya. And these are the final almost discoveries of physics in the 20th century. John Barrows wrote a book called uh, Impossibility, where he shows in every field, as the field advances far enough, as it advances, you get the feeling we'll know everything. But as it advances far enough, deep enough, you end up with certain insoluble contradictions, paradoxes, the limits to knowledge. By the way, it's interesting. Uh, in the first week of April, here in New York, in the New School, there's going to be a workshop, two-day workshop. And guess what the title is? Unknow unknowability. Each session, unknowability in, in, life, in social sciences, unknowability in physics, unknowability in mathematics. John Barrows is speaking. Rebecca Goldstein is speaking also. And it's open to the public in a new school. Uh, 4th and 5th April. Unknowability, the limits to knowledge. I was in the Shivananda Yoga Ashram in Bahamas in a, few, a couple of weeks ago. Not for a cruise, for giving talks. <laughs> And there was this mathematician from Oxford who was going to give talks afterwards, Marcus du Satoy. And the subject of his talk was on science. The subject was what we cannot know. So the limits to knowledge, Vivekananda says, we feel we should be able to know. But very soon we come up against the more we know, the more we see we do not know. And this is Maya, the limits to knowledge. Our senses drag us out outwards uh, to see, to hear, to smell, to experience this world, to taste this world. And sense pleasure promises enjoyment and satisfaction and happiness and gives us some satisfaction too, but always unfulfilled. Always unfulfilled. The more we try, the more our hunger and our barrenness increases. Somerset Mom, you know, very beautiful, he says that, that, that quote, um, the more single-mindedly you chase pleasure, the more you find nothing pleasing anymore. Uh, the limits to the 
and Vivekananda says, we are drawn, yet we are drawn, again and again, like moths to the fire. Uh, and we keep, after knowing this also, we keep repeating those behaviors, those learned patterns of behavior. His words, until crippled, we are swept away by death. And this is Maya, the limits of sense pleasures. With every breath we feel we are free. We have freedom. I, I'm acting of my own will. And yet when I investigate, when I try to act in life, do something in life, I run up against barriers. I see that there are limits to my free will. The more I investigate, you know, this is one, of, one perpetual fa favorite for philosophers through, in the East and the West, throughout the world, throughout history, is their free will. Because we feel there is free will. And yet science seems to say, determinism, that there cannot be free will. Religion says, all is God's will, not yours. Philosophical investigation, even neu neuroscience investigations, uh, the Libet experiments and all. So many kinds of ideas have been generated, which all of which seem to show that we do not have free will. This every breath we feel we are free, and the universe telling us again and again we are not free at all. And this is Maya. Swami Vivekananda says, this is Maya. Then he says, um, happiness, our pursuit of happiness. The more we change social reforms, feudalism, unhappiness, we change it into communism, into capitalism, into socialism. Uh, Becker, the denial of death, he calls them our bloody utopias. As we try to get happiness from this world and make great changes in this world, we seem to redistribute misery. That's all. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda says, like rheumatism, you chase it from here, it goes there. <laughs> You're just redistributing misery. And this is Maya. He says, as we increase the power of enjoyment, we are increasing the power of suffering too. In, he, says, he says in geometric progression, little bit of increase in the power of enjoyment, multiple times increase in the power of suffering. He says, who, um, who can enjoy food like a dog eating? Uh, but the dog suffers also tremendously. He says, the, the primitive man in, in the uh, cave uh, stone age society, uh, uh, you know, a, could take a cut on the hand and it would heal him uh, very soon. Uh, he, would be, he would be very hardy, but crude. Uh, will be completely unable to enjoy the products of our you know, Broadway and, and the museum mile. No, makes no difference to that person. But in the, he says the modern man, cultured and refined, can has power of enjoyment and aesthetic sensibilities multiplied many fold, but a pinprick can kill him. And I was thinking in our modern context, there's a lot of um, psychological studies going on. The new generation of children coming up, protected, nurtured to be super kids, uh, no exposure to dirt, Ex uh, vulnerability to infections. The number of studies are showing multiple kinds of allergies are coming up. Why? Where did these allergies come from? They're coming because they were not exposed to uh, nature, no contact with uh, but not just physical vulnerability, emotional vulnerability. All the time saying, you're great. You're the greatest. Uh, if, you've done, if, you, if you got it right, you're the greatest. If you got it wrong, you're still pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> and shielded from failure, shielded from criticism, shielded from any kind of humiliation, nothing. There are hard knocks of life shielded by parents. Um, the result is, when these children come out into society, a little bit of criticism, a little bit of failure, automatic. It, it'll, it's going to bound to happen. A little suffering, physical, and they fall apart. They become, they become outraged and, uh, and indignant, and why is this happening to me? How can, it's like a little child who's never been scolded. The first time the child is scolded, it throws a tantrum. How can you do this to me? It's like... <laughs> but suffering, is often necessary for growth. <laughs> like I, I don't know if the example is appropriate. There's one, uh, I, I heard this several years ago. The 
Japanese are fond of a particular sea fish, which is uh, very tasty. So they decided that they're going to cultivate it in, um, in enclosed uh, fishery lagoons, you know, so that they can cultivate much more instead of trying to going out to sea, sea and trying to catch those ones, have a whole crop of them. So they cultivated and they got a bountiful crop of those, uh, yield of those, that particular kind of fish. But there was no taste anymore in those fishes. They're bigger, but, but more of them, but no taste. They thought, what is wrong? Why aren't they tasty? And then they discovered in the sea that chase, those fish are chased by sharks. And when they chase, they, they, they fear they produce a particular kind of hormone or something which gives taste. <laughs> so what they did was a solution. They introduced a baby shark to that, 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 <laughs> to that lagoon. And so that baby shark can't eat too many. So if they eat it, eat it up, there's no use. But it's enough to scare the fish. And so the fish go round and round, and the char little shark chases them round, and the fish become tasty. Now, <laughs> this development, and we have heard the story of how if you try to help a cocoon you know, by opening it up and letting it, the butterfly can't fly because that exercises. We have heard the stories. I don't know how true it is. But it is true that the more you increase the power of enjoyment, the more refined, the more uh, protected, the more vulnerable, the more weak, the more prone to suffering. And this is Maya, Swami Vivekananda says. He speaks about the, he says, a mother loves her child, no end, dotes upon the child. It is her whole life, the child is her whole life. And uh, the child, perhaps son, grows up to be a brute and abuses the mother and uh, is a source of misery to her. And yet she cannot give up the child. And society perhaps praises her for it and uh, criticizes the child for being ungrateful. And yet the mother knows it is not really love. It is something that she, ca she cannot shake off. It's uh, a kind of obsession, kind of a weakness. Uh, and sh she would perhaps be better off shaking that thing off. And yet she cannot. And this is Maya, it's from Vivekananda directly. The drama of life. We come into this life, not a blank slate. Vivekananda says it, like the poet said, coming, we come trailing clouds of glory, but he says, some of us come trailing clouds of black smoke too. So, <laughs> some scars, past life, we have had many past lives. And we live in this life, in youth, it is all golden, full of uh, hope and, and possibilities. As we go, grow older, uh, we become older and more dis disappointed and bitter, maybe wiser, but bitter. And then finally, death comes and sweeps us away from the stage of life. We see in a stage of life, we were kids there. One monk, Dutch, uh, in our order, he is from the Netherlands. So when his parents uh, were up, about to pass away or to die, uh, he went back to Netherlands to see them for one last time. And he said, later on he came and told me, they were in an assisted living facility, but he went to their family house. And he said, how interesting, the same house where I and my brothers and sisters, we grew up. We played there in that garden. We lived in those rooms. Other children are playing there. Other children are living in those rooms. Other dads and mums are living there. The stage is the same. The actors are different. We are gone. Death sweeps us away. And Vivekananda adds poignantly, victorious or defeated, we do not know. And this is Maya. Krishna and Narada, they are walking together. And Narada says to Krishna, same question, Oh Krishna, can you tell me what is Maya? Krishna says, ask me something else. <laughs> and Narada says, no, I want to know this. Krishna says, all right, you asked for it. But um, before that, could you... I'm very thirsty. Could you go and get me a um, little water to drink? Narada says, immediately I'll do that. Please wait here. And he walks to the nearby village, to the uh, well there, and he sees this girl drawing water there. When he comes near the young lady, he's captivated by her beauty. And he says, could you give me a, a pot of water, a, a jar of water? And she says, certainly, sir. And then he starts talking with her, and they become friendly, and he's so enamored of her, uh, she brings him home and introduces him to her father and uh, they like him so much and he likes them and he falls in love with this girl and he proposes marriage the father accepts him and gives him the family business and he uh, settles down there 
and they are very happy. They have their first child as years go by, the second child and the third child. And um, years later, one day at night, and he's a busy householder now with a lot of responsibilities, a flood comes, a flash flood. Uh, no alert those days, mobile phone. <laughs> And the water is rising. In terror, Narada gets up and uh, grabs hold of his, the baby child and the other child and the, the more grown teenage child. Uh, I mean, I mean the, uh, the, the first child and his wife, three kids. And some a bundle of the possessions and somehow staggers out into the rising flood waters. Before he can do anything, the baby is swept away from his shoulders. And the other child is swept away from his arm. Finally, his uh, eldest child and his beloved wife, they're all swept away. And he's thrown on the, on the shore, weeping and lamenting, and he loses consciousness. And he wakes up slowly, and he sees Krishna standing and looking at him. <laughs> he says, Narada, where have you, wherever have you been? It's nearly half an hour I've been waiting. <laughs> Twelve years of his life have passed, and it's been half an hour only. And this is Maya. Vivekananda says. Sri Ramakrishna, he gives the example of a, of a monk in Dakshineshwar. He says, there's a wonderful monk who came to the temple garden of Dakshineshwar and he would stay in his little room and he would never come out. He would never mix with anybody. He would never talk with anybody. He spent the whole day in meditation and prayer. One day, you know, the Bengal monsoon, dark clouds come and covers everything. The whole sky is covered and the, the whole, the temple and the river and the city, they all become dark and, and gloomy. And then a strong wind came and blew the sky, the, the dark clouds away and there's a blue shining sky again. And this monk, he for the first time came out of his room and he laughed out loud and he started dancing. And then Sri Ramakrishna goes to him and asks him, you did not come out all these days. Now what is it that you have seen that you are laughing and dancing? And then the sadhu said in his Hindi broken, uh, in, he said it in Hindi, he said, uh, yes, samsar ka maya aisa hi hai. The maya of samsar is just like that. Blue shining sky, everything is all right. Suddenly dark clouds come. And it's all dark and gloomy and terrible. And then wind comes and blows it away and it's all back and shining again. This is the Maya of samsara. Swami Vivekananda gives his approach to Maya. He says, our very being, our life, our very being is this contradiction. These contradictions he showed, a series of paradoxes and contradictions and this is Maya. He says, our very being in this is this Maya is not a theory, is not an explanation of the world. This is Dira Vivekananda's words, very important. Because so far, the non-dualists have been struggling to provide an explanation because they've been asked for an explanation. Maya is not an explanation, not a theory to explain the world. Then what is it? He says Maya is simply a statement of fact. It's simply a description of the sheer contradictoriness, the sheer paradoxical nature of life. Just a simple description. That is Maya. He says this common folk in India, they say all is Maya. Sab Maya hai. And he says, that, I think that's as wonderful a statement as you're going to get about the state, the state of things in this world. All this is indeed Maya. Now, there are um, two powerful objections to this approach. One is, Vivekananda himself brings it up. One is, why are you saying that all this is Maya and this you should transcend this, this is, this is paradoxical, contradictory? There is a school of philosophical thought, very powerful. Vivekananda himself says, in Germany, certain philosophers have proposed, he, he meant Hegel, he actually meant Hegel, that if you look at Hegel's philosophy, this, he says, literally, it sounds so Vedantic. He says, the absolute, the spirit, is manifesting itself in this universe through lower to higher and higher manifestations till it will become the absolute perfect being. So we are going from primitive manifestations to better manifestations. Things are becoming better and better and better. It's a progressive development. 
Hegel's whole idea of dialectics comes from that. And it's a very powerful idea. And it influenced the course of Western thought. From Hegel to, um, you know, to Marx is a direct line. Marx just removed the spirit aspect of it, took the dialectics and material dialecticism and Marxism and all of that. So very powerful development of Western thought comes from Hegel. And Hegel's, he said, when you read his logic, the very first line, how pure being or, or the spirit manifests itself as non-being. And from being and non-being, uh, this dialectical process comes this universe, comes change. And like that, the, the Hegelian dialectic. Now Vivekananda strongly opposes this. By the way, when I read this first, I was impressed by the, with how Vedantic it sounded. If you read the first few lines of Hegel's logic, so there was a conference in the new school, a Hegelian scholar was going to speak, a young Hegelian scholar, Moder, from, from, uh, from Slovenia, uh, Stephen Moder. So I went to hear that, the talk. And, uh, this, and they were a very, um, very philosophical crowd, beards and backpacks and <laughs> scruffy hair and intense looks. And they sort of looked at me I was weird enough to fit into that, so. Uh, <laughs> I, when it was time for Q&A, I asked the scholar, uh, Moder, that, uh, you know, it just might be my conditioning, but I see certain resonances between what Hegel has said here, at least at the beginning, not later on, but at the beginning, what he has said, and Upanishadic thought. And remember, the background is Hegel had a very poor opinion of Indian and Chinese philosophy. He said all philosophy there is there, it's in Europe, and there's no philosophy worth the name in uh, India or uh, in China. So, but it seems very Upanishadic, Vedantic. And uh, he said, his response was very interesting. He's a leading scholar of Hegel now. It, it seems it's a new trend in Hegelian studies. He said, you are absolutely right, Swami. It's, it's entirely from there. It's that very thought from the Upanishadic idea, the, the expression of Brahman. And he said, but maybe it's just, uh, there are echoes, or resonances, similarities. Then he said to me, Moder, in, in the whole gathering, in front of everybody, he said, you are just being polite. He Hegel stole it, his words, Hegel stole the entire thing from there. He says, steal it from there, my, my idea, no credit to them, because they couldn't have invented it, they are backward, barbarians, there's, uh, there's nothing there. <laughs> this, I, I thought this is, I've never heard this, but I asked a Hegelian scholar, you know Ayon Maharaj, so he, he is, who, who gave a talk here, he's a well-known scholar on Hegel, so he said yes, this is a new line of investigation. How much did actually Hegel knew, know about uh, Asian philosophy, and how much he took from there? I in fact asked another philosopher whom you might recognize, Zizek, Slavoj Zizek, he's a superstar, <laughs> crazy, you just have to look at Z-I-Z-E-K. So he spoke in the, um, the um, Schwarzman building, the New York Public Library here in Manhattan, near Bryant Park, so I went to attend that, because I, I have heard him speak on YouTube and I've read his uh, work earlier, so I was very interested. Uh, he is... Uh, in one word, crazy. So if you, if, you, if you listen to him for 10 minutes also, you will know. Now he says the most outrageous things, um, for, but he says it for effect. If you actually wait a little bit, it's not so outrageous. He has got, he is actually saying something good. For example, outrageous thing, right here in, in the New York Public Library, when he was giving his talk, he said this, and even just saying this can get me into trouble. Uh, but listen to the whole explanation, which is a very good point he makes. He said, Gandhi is actually more violent than Hitler. <laughs> Everybody looking so outraged. What? How dare you say that? And the people around me looking like this. And I said, wait, I know him. <laughs> so <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> he says, Gandhi actually destroyed the British Empire by his nonviolence. He changed the world. What did Hitler change? Nothing. The same old world, more violence, and then its same world continued after that. <laughs> so uh, Gandhi is actually more violent than <laughs> Hitler. So he speaks like that. Anyway, um, so that's why I was a little hesitant. If I go up to him, a monk like this, and ask a question, I don't know what he will say, which is, <laughs> I don't mind, but uh, <laughs> so I sort of, uh, I went up to him and asked him, the same question about, because he's 
one of the leading scholars of Hegel in the world today. So I asked him, Professor Zizek, what do you think of Hegel's views of Indian philosophy? And he said, he's a very strong Slovenian accent. Oh, he's just studied secondary sources. He didn't know enough. He didn't know enough. And this is, this is somebody, remember who is saying this? His background is Marxist and Freudian. Psychoanalytic and Marxism. This is the background from which he comes. So he is absolutely no friend of any kind of religion or spirituality. Or that. But he said uh, Hegel did an injustice to Indian philosophy. But he also said something interesting, just as a way, I'll, I'll, just as an aside, I'll share it. I said, what do you think about Schopenhauer? Because, you know, Schopenhauer loved Indian philosophy. He said, he read the Upanishads. It was his favorite reading. Every day in the night, he would read a few pages of the Upanishads and go to sleep before that. Before going to sleep, he would read the uh, few pages of the Upanishads. He said, I consider no other study in the world as beneficial as the study of these Upanishads, the translation, except perhaps the original. These Upanishads have been the solace of my life and will be the solace of my death. Schopenhauer. His masterpiece, The World as Will and Idea, The World as Will and Idea, in the uh, first chapter, he says, what I shall say in these volumes, Schopenhauer says, what I shall say in these volumes was best known to the ancient Hindus. They called it Maya. So I asked Zizek, what do you think of Schopenhauer? But he had an interesting point of view. He said, even I think even Schopenhauer westernized Indian thought. Right? Interesting, because Vivekananda also had the same, has the same opinion. So what is Vivekananda's objection? The spirit is expressing itself. Everything is getting better and better and better. Ultimately, it will reach perfection. Hitler loved that, by the way. It's expressing itself. And now the best expression now is the state. And of course, in the state, it means the German state. And of course, in German state, it means a Nazi state. And of course, the best expression of that is I, Hitler. <laughs> so the ultimate expression of the absolute. <laughs> anyway, um, Vivekananda's objection is this. Any kind of expression is limitation, right? To actually, what is expression? Name and form, time, space, and causation. A thing, a, no matter how beautiful a thing, no matter how advanced something, it's still a thing. It is one thing and not the other thing. If it is an expression in time, space, and causation, it's a finite thing. The infinite can express itself only in fi finite things. So any kind of expression, no matter how wonderful, will still be finite. The infinite cannot be expressed as the infinite. This is the deep, fundamental flaw in Hegelian thought. That ultimately it will become the absolute. No, it will become an imitation of the absolute. So then what is the answer? Vivekananda says, the answer the ancient Vedantins found was, not in the flow of Maya, but against the current. That the infinite is expressing itself and experiencing itself in all these ways and finally realizes that true peace is not to be found here. True fulfillment is not to be found here. Completion is not to be found here. Infinity is not to be found here. And then begins the movement inwards. Vivekananda says two words, pravritti and nivritti. Pravritti means circling outwards, wider and wider circles into the universe. Nivritti means circling inwards. And he says true spirituality begins with this inward movement. He says renunciation therefore is the basis of spirituality. Not Peace is not to be found in a thing out there. Peace is not to be found in the object. It is to be found in the subject. So the source Movement back to the source, to Brahman. That is spirituality. That is Vedanta. Another objection, the second great objection comes, he says, which is more uh, common here in the world today. Very few of us seriously in Manhattan, if you ask, are you a Hegelian or something? <laughs> what? <laughs> they look at you strangely and walk away from you. So very few are Hegelians. <laughs> But many people are what might be called Vivekananda, he says, the second objection, agnostics. We really don't know all this. Absolute, expressing itself, maybe, maybe not, who knows. All we know is this life 
and try to make the best of this life. Somehow muddle through, try to you know make hay while uh, uh, what make hay while the sun is shining. Yes, while the sun shines. Vivekananda says this position has a great flaw. The flaw is this: it says take life minus the ideal component. The moment we have life, moment we are here, all of us. We seek to transcend it. We want more. We want, uh, we want something transcending this world. We want God, nirvana, moksha, transcendence, fulfillment. The moment we have something, we seek to overflow. Life overflows it. So this ideal component, which has been there from immemorial times, uh, from, the, from the primitive um, uh, societies up to modern times, in all our religion, our spirituality, our idealism, Agnosticism seems to say that just take the material aspect of life, just the commonplace aspect of life, and leave out all of that. That's a very limited point. It might satisfy you. It will not satisfy the next person. Why? Religion, art, spirituality, scientific quest, all of them seek to go beyond what we already have. How can you say that this much only is life? So agnosticism has this great, great defect. It takes a very limited snapshot of life and leaves out there. It cannot fulfill your heart. You will go beyond it. What is beyond it? The quest for freedom. Quest for freedom beyond Maya. It has always been there. Something within us says, not this, not this, neti neti, there is something higher than this. Freedom. Vivekananda says that, uh, in the most primitive of religions, when you have all these deities, the god of thunder, the god of sun or the rain, um, we have these ideas, these gods, who are these gods? They are personified ideas of our freedom. I cannot do these things. I am subject to death, disease and hunger. Here is a god who is free of these things. Beautiful, perfect, immortal. The Polytheistic religions began that way, with multiple, multiple manifestations of our conception of freedom, freedom from Maya. As religion advanced, we came to the idea of one ultimate reality, beyond Maya. This ultimate reality, beyond Maya, beyond time, space and causation, who creates this entire universe? This is the god of the monotheistic religions. That one god, the great insight that the religions in the Middle East had, the Abrahamic religions, that there is one God, that one ultimate reality rules over this entire universe, beyond this universe. And there the monotheistic religion stopped, whether it's the Jehovah of the Jews or the Father in heaven or, or Allah or the theistic religions in India with Vishnu or the Divine Mother or Shiva. But Vedanta begins there. Vivekananda said, that's the beginning of Vedanta. That is in fact dualistic Vedanta. Vedanta goes further. Further, that God who is beyond time, space and, and causation is also within time, space and causation as the immanent reality of this entire universe. Everywhere in this universe is that one, rea one reality. Within all beings, in and through all these existences, an immanent God, transcendent and immanent God. Every, sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, all this is indeed that divinity. Spinoza's God, the great um, philosopher, 17th century. Spinoza. Einstein here, by the way, I, I mentioned Rebecca Goldstein, she's one of the leading authorities on Spinoza. So she, in her a uh, book, in a talk she mentioned Einstein. In fact, Einstein said, here he, in Princeton, he, uh, he was here, he said, the only God I believe in is Spinoza's God. The God who reveals himself through the orderly workings of the universe, uh, as this universe, not the God who concerns himself with the doings of mortal man. And then he wrote a poem. Uh, Einstein wrote a poem, it's available, if you see Einstein's poem on Spinoza, uh, full of, he says, the, the, this, this holy man, he says, to uh, uh, an admiration of Spinoza. Spinoza's God, a pantheistic, I'd say a little bit of injustice to, Pinoza to call, Spinoza to call him pantheistic, panentheistic would be a more precise word, but anyway, 
God as this entire universe, as appearing as this universe. And yet, this is not non-dualism. All this is Brahman. If you literally take it that way, it is Vishishtadvaita, qualified monism. Spinoza's God is this. This entire universe is God or a part of God. The entire sen insentient universe and us sentient beings, we are parts of the divine. So this is uh, Spinoza's conception. Like our body, hands and feet and head, all parts of one integral entity called my body. Similarly, we are all parts of one divine reality goes further. When you say all this is Brahman, it can be interpreted as Vishishtadvaita. But when you say all this is not, Brahman alone is, then you come to Advaita. Mary Hale wrote in a poem to Vivekananda, I have understood what you have taught, that all you are saying, you are teaching, everything is God. And Vivekananda said, I have never taught such strange doctrine, that all is God. Mary Hale protested. She said, you, you said it. You said those very words, that all is God. He said, no, what I meant is, all is not, God only is. Brahman only is the only reality. That which was outside time, space and causation as the God of religion, which becomes the Vishishtadvaita, the one divine unity of this universe, Spinoza's God. In Advaita, the final development it comes, it is none other than you yourself. You, the individual being, you appear as subject and object, as a sentient being, as the insentient universe, as the one and the many. Advaita comes to this grand conclusion. Vivekananda says, human thought reaches there such heights that the, that the human lung can scarce breathe there. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. When I truly realize, I am that which I was looking for outside. Tattvamasi. That thou art. This is the reality that was hidden by Maya all along. What was hidden by Maya? You were hidden by Maya. Maya did not hide the truth from you. You are the truth. So the play of Maya was your own play. And finally you see, now you stand in the bright sunshine, sunlight, beyond darkness forever. And look back upon the same world. The same world is now transformed from a hellhole, from a struggle and strife and darkness and death and unhappiness into an immortal reality. And all this becomes, you are the stage upon which the drama of life is being staged. You transcend sorrow, you transcend misery, transcend death. Trinvantu Vishwe Amritasya Putraha Listen ye children of immortal bliss. Aye dhamani divyani tastu Even ye that dwell in higher heavens for this is the truth that even you do not know. The gods do not know this truth. Vedaham purusham mahantam. I have realized that infinite being. Aditya varnam tamasaf parastat. Blazing forth like the sun. Forever beyond the darkness of sorrow and death and limitation. Tameva viditva. By realizing that alone. Ati mrityumeti. One goes beyond death and suffering. There is no other path. All other paths lead to Maya. There is only this path. How do you realize that? That ultimate being? You realize that as the god of religion, devotion. As the god of Spinoza, that reality all around. And finally, as I myself. Aham Brahmasmi. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, to the Holy Mother, and to Swami Vivekananda. That these insights may shine forth in our hearts in this very life. And may we be blessed by the glimpse of light beyond Maya. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu